Okay. Actually, can folks on Zoom just give a quick thumbs up if the audio is okay? We're using external mics this time, so it should be a little bit better than last time. Okay. I'm seeing one thumb up. Okay, thanks. Yep, a couple. Yep. You guys can see okay? Yep. Would you guys rather me do the seated or do you guys want me to stand up? How do you guys want me to do it? Do you care? No, we don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter, but seated would be closer to the mic. Okay. All right. So um, we uh, appreciate the opportunity to sort of get back together. Uh, the team and, and I have spent quite a bit of time talking about uh, sort of what we discussed so far. And I think um, rather than bringing a counter proposal today, I think what we wanted to do is bring some of the, the research and information that we've done in response to what you've presented. Because I think that in order for us to make progress, I think our team believes that we need to we need to talk about some of the underlying assumptions that where where we've arrived at the proposals we're seeing. So um, again, we talked a little bit. We we'll talked a little bit about session structure, and then we've updated the perceived JU interest. We want to provide some clarifications to some of the things we've said because we think that maybe either we didn't explain them well, or we just want to make sure that you understood what we have offered. And then we did a lot of work and research on comparators. Um, you know, we think that it's it's worthy of going through some of that. So that's what we have for you today. Um, so the, what are the interests that we've had? Uh, we'd like to continue exchanging clear positions and offering clarification as needed. Um, identifying team members explicitly would be helpful. There's been a couple times, to be honest, that we weren't sure if the person who was speaking on your side was speaking, if they were actually speaking on behalf of the team or if they were just asking a question or whatever. So I think we need some clarification on that. Um, and, and when you give us the names next time, that'll probably take care of itself automatically. Uh, providing information as requested, obviously it was, um, you know, we had some back and forth last time about whether or not you guys had asked for some information, whether or not we'd provided it, whether or not we knew the information you wanted. It, what, we, we don't want that to happen again. If you guys have a need for information or clarification, we wanna make sure that we provide that to you. Um, so that we don't then devolve into just disagreeing about whether or not the clarification you sought was provided or not. Not that we're gonna necessarily agree on it, but whether or not it's provided for you is, is important. Uh, Green and Cox is a pro, we haven't had a problem with that. So the next one is about refraining from a town hall meeting. I, I just wanna state that I think there's an important difference between a public meeting and a public forum. And I think that understanding when we're in which version of that is important to us. So, you know, it, it's one thing, obviously it's a public meeting, anybody can come and wants, but once we start, bargaining with 50 people, it gets a little unwieldy for our side of the table. So I just wanna, I wanna say that. And again, that goes back to knowing who's actually on your team and who isn't. Um, making, uh, maybe it was covering up my slides here. Uh, making progress towards an agreement on individual items, which we've discussed already. Um, and then as I've said to you all before uh, in our individual meetings and then also in the sessions, considering an objective joint statement at some point, once we start making some progress, you know, we'd be interested in those things. Um, the stuff on the left hasn't changed, but uh, we went back and stated what we thought were the highlights from your last presentation that you restated, and we appreciated that. One is to increase the minimums as a priority. Uh, two was avoiding percentage raises. Three was stopping one-time payments. And four was you wanted to base your raises on inflation and other sort of economic factors. Um, we, we, we recognize that you have made these clear. Unfortunately, I think what you're going to see in our presentation is that I think some of our interests run pretty counter to these, and I'm, I'm going to be very open and honest about that. I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. And I think that some of that is going to come out in some of the information I have for you today and we have for you today. So one of the things that my team had actually asked that we clarify, and I think it's important because it may be a little confusing, and we didn't intend it to be confusing, but I think it may have been, was um, I thought we heard um, you know, that the fear relief was actually going to be a pay cut. And so... I just wanted to quickly do an estimation of, of, our, of how we think this would impact the stipend. Um, and it would be the equivalent fee payment to stipends at a rate of 105%. So just so you can see the simple math, um, you know, 15.81 for a health fee and 944 for a transportation fee is 25, 25 per credit, 18 credits, 450, 450 times 105% would be 477.23. So again, whether or not it's, it's a philosophical opposition to the fee relief going away in terms of actual dollars, we didn't calculate that as a pay cut. So again, that's just for your own purposes and just for your own clarification, we felt like we wanted to put that in there. 
Yeah, go ahead. I just have a question about summer. Sure. So would this just be a flat for 7723? In that case, it would not incorporate summer figure leave. So that was based on 18 credits because okay. it's done on a credit basis. Okay, but then that's still only okay. Okay. So again, this was yeah. just an example. So it would on... be, so you would be, so I guess the bursar or UFHR would then be looking at the actual registration per GA. Right. Okay. Okay. That was just my or, or however we would agree to implement it. Think about it more in broad strokes, is this is our intent. The actual specific details of somebody, if if there's a particular program that say, look, this program, not because of a student's individual choices, but this program requires that you register for 21 credits a year, you know, we we can work through the okay. details on that if we can if we can philosophically agree that this is an approach that we can both agree to. Uh, so the next one we talked a lot about, and I, and I actually asked a couple of clarifying questions last time for 2017. So when we looked back on the impact from 2017, I actually had class and comp poll how many GAs are here that are still GAs that were hired in fall of 2017. And the number is four. So I know, again, I asked last time, like, what was the, why did we use 2017 as a, as sort of a, a post hole or an example or an exemplar of when we want to start tracking economic impact? So again, I think that that left as a question mark for us, um, because that represents, you know, four out of 4,400 people. Um, when I asked class and comp to tell me how many people came in fall of 2017 and remain in the GA capacity going into next fall. So I just don't know how widespread of an issue that is if it's that small of a percentage. So um, I just wanted to, we wanted to say that. I, I just, there are GAs who came in before 2017 who are still GAs. Like So myself. they're going into like their eighth year? Seventh year. Okay. And also please remember that there are six year programs, right. right? The English program is six years with often if you're coming in with just a BA with the, op, with the option to extend for seven years. So there are GAs like myself who were hired in fall 2016. So again, I still agree it's a very small number, yeah. but it's... And also we weren't using that percentage of people to... The reason why we chose 2017 as a metric was not to say that we have a large population of GAs who existed from 2017 onward. Mm -hmm. It was to show that 2017 is when we had our highest raise when accounting for inflation, not necessarily having to do with how many GAs were enrolled, but to show that we have reached a number that's closer or more comparable to a living wage in the past. Yeah, but I think the way that, and I could be wrong because I only saw the analysis quickly, but I thought in Austin's analysis, when you guys recalculated what the percentage raise was, you you leveraged it against the economic impact of inflation since 2017 on a continuous basis. That was my interpretation of what you presented last time. It wasn't a whip one snapshot inflation just for 22, 23. I believe that he had actually impacted the inflation year over year for the last six years. I could be wrong, but again, I didn't get to right. see all the math no, that's behind. correct. So, that's so. correct. The point is to show how our stipend has not kept up with inflation over time. Yeah, and that's and again, that goes back to the reason that we showed this slide. I'm not sure how compelling of an argument the UF team believes it would be for the majority of TAs who are or GAs who are not here for say 2017 through 2020 to talk about the plight that was experienced, maybe or maybe not by people who are either no longer here, but who because are not Because the that. conditions have changed in Gainesville. The people have gone, but the economic conditions of Gainesville remain inflated. Yeah, I think we understand that. Yeah, I, I don't-, I don't It's not if you don't understand why we're using 2017 as a number or why we're showing time data over time. Well, I, my statement, my statement, Bryn, was I find it I do not find it a compelling argument for somebody who was not even here yet to talk and look backwards to inflationary impact before they were even an employee. I, what I'm saying is I don't find that to be compelling. Why wouldn't it be compelling if you were able to offer a certain uh, quality of life for the people in 2017? Why is it not compelling to say that today we should receive a comparable. The, the comparable quality of life. So I think that's a good question because I think one of the things that you're going to see here today is the fact that I think that the terms in which we describe stipend payments and contracts are just in fundamentally different terms than the way that GAU does. And the reason I say that is because I do not think that the most compelling factor is one of either of, of external social, exter external economic pressures is not the way that we construct our stipends. We construct our stipends based on a number of factors but not primarily based on that. And you're going to see some things here in a minute about revenues and revenue differences. And I know that you all said that, look, the budget's not our problem. We don't care about revenues. That's your job. We don't get paid to do that. But we have to look at that. So that's one of the reasons that I wanted to show some of that to you today, because I, I appreciate that it's not something that you necessarily 
think you should have to worry about, but it is something that we have to worry about. So um, this is actually from the graduate school. And I think this goes to a little bit, I put this up here because it, it goes to one of the things that we talked about before. And again, it's gonna go to that assumption of what a GA is and the purpose of the GA, the graduate assistantships and programs. And if you look that the first one clearly is financial support for the student in the form of paid employment. But if you look down at the second, third and fourth bullets, you know, it does talk about the fact that there are other values to the experience besides just, just the payout. So I think that looking at a GA as a pure, as a pure employee is, is, is short-sighted. And I think that's one of the reasons that at least we wanted to at least say that. Um, and, and, you know, I appreciate that you may find that comical, but we don't find it comical. So here's the published cost of attendance um, for, um, this is off the, the website. Now, why did I put this up here? Why did I put this up here is because you all had mentioned international students. Mm -hmm. And I believe, Rachel, I don't want to misquote you, something along that you're forcing our international students to live in poverty, I think was the actual yes. quote. So, so here's what's interesting about the international students. International students, um, I'll get back to that in a minute. International students, before they come here to get their visa, have to demonstrate the fact that they already have the funding before they're allowed to be signed off on the visa. Mm -hmm. So if they have to demonstrate that they have the funding, and these are the numbers they're given. And by the way, if you look right directly in the information, it says adding a spouse is another $6,000, $2,500 for each additional accompanying child. So I guess what I'm saying is if these are the stated costs and then you get a letter of offer, which is far under that, there must be some transition that occurs between the decision to come and now where making up that difference becomes solely the university's responsibility. And, and I, I think that's where we're, we're struggling a little bit. Oh. Um, and that's where we're struggling to sort of understand how that becomes, there's a clear offer given, mm -hmm. the person made the decision to come, the stated costs were significant, but now we are forcing them to live in poverty. I just, I'm really having a hard time. Well, having a finite time. amount such as up here, you have $50,000, 235, $50,235. That's a finite amount that they have to prove that they have in their bank account before coming here. Once they are here, their only source of income is from the university. And since this is their only source of income and this is their only employment opportunity, it is up to the university to provide that money. One, one year of study. It says one year of study. So, I mean, I don't know what it says. It says very clearly that's one year study cost. So I'm not sure what, what was expected to occur between the time that the appointment started and that other $34,000. Like, I'm not sure what the, what the false promise was that we may have led people to believe that all that money was going to be made up by so, us. Um, again, I don't want to speak for my international students, um, but oftentimes international students aren't told that they're actually going to have to pay fees here because they believe that the tuition remission covers 100% of fees. There are a lot of things that international students are not told before they come here, including the costs, including the extra expenses of adding dependents. Because again, how many other countries have as jacked a medical system as the United States? They're coming from a lot of places that have socialized medicine, so they're not expecting these costs. So what I'm saying is that graduate students come here, international graduate students, and are shocked at a lot of what is hidden costs. The other thing is that in order to apply for their visas, they have to, um, the actual federal level, for the United States government, the federal government to approve their visa, they have to prove an income that is higher than what UF actually pays them. So they have to have money saved because of how little UF pays them. Right. And that is no, I UF that. essentially acknowledging they don't pay high enough to actually that's have not graduate right. students. That's, that's not how it works. We're, that's, we're not acknowledging. Not only that, but there is no, there is not a, I couldn't find a single program in the country, I mean, you can compare us to whoever you want, that would pay enough to a GA, a, a starting GA that would cover that cost. That's I couldn't tuition. find one. That includes tuition. No. Total Living cost. expenses plus tuition, total right. cost. That includes tuition. Right. right. And your tuition is waived. So why wouldn't they expect? So how much is tuition remission? For, for on an international student? I've got it on the next. I've got it on the next. Okay. With the tuition. But that is included in that. So they're not paying that out I of pocket because they're RA ship. Go ahead, Bren. I also want to say that since U.S. bargaining team does not have the fortune to be informed by the actual international student experience, um, we have several international students on this call that can explain to you exactly how it works, particularly Izu, um, that can explain to you how it works if you want to know since they've actually been through it. 
we we could stop right and keep going. I mean, it's up it's up to you. I mean, I I again, this is I don't think he's a member of the bargaining team or she's a member of the bargaining team. But we represent them as a whole, and we I appreciate that. I mean, you're to welcome to put them on your okay. bargaining. Yeah, yeah, then I think I think if he's comfortable, then I think hold on. Why don't we finish and then you guys can have income to get a visa? Hold yeah. on, hold on one second, Cody. Hold on. Hold on one second. Hold on one second. We're gonna call it. Uh, if if Ease is ready to explain, then I think um, we're not. Uh, I'm sorry. Calling. We're not doing that right now. We're presenting. Yeah. The management team is presenting, and if there's time at the end for Did comment, you just say that it was up okay, to well, us. Okay. Well, you just it. said that you would be fine that's with it doing so. That's, that's why right. I proceeded. And I, I just think that we're we're trying to present some positions here, and I and I and we have a well laid out. Okay. Sure. Way sure. that we're okay, thinking about fine. it, but I think that's we're kind of getting on track. Okay. Sure. The that's point of this was presentation was and then we'll present have some information program. about what is presented to international students. Mm -hmm. This is directly from the youth at website. Yeah, so. and, and this is not like in some, I mean, this is right on the main page when I went to the main site, so like if you're interested in becoming a student here, like this wasn't like hidden in some PDF. I mean, this was right on the main, it was right okay, on the main. I think during comment, then we can have the international students clarify. All right, so. This, or did you want to go back to this? Oh, yeah, sorry. So um, this is an important, This of all the things that we wanted to bring up, this is actually from the model that you guys presented the first time we got together. We think that this is a very important thing. And I actually brought this up at the end of our last session. The living wage calculation from MIT is predicated on a sole provider working full-time, which they estimate is 2,080 hours per year. So we think that it's very important that we contextualize all of the all of the information that we've received from you regarding the living wage within that context. So I just want to make, and I didn't create the slide. This is right off of the slide that you guys, or the source that you guys were citing for your previous components. Okay, there's a, there's a ton of information on this slide. And I will, I'll email this to you, Amanda, so you guys can look at it. Because um, this took a while for us to put together. And I'm going to, I'm going to stand up a little bit. Um, so, you know, we, we clearly, you guys had talked a lot about, um, you guys have talked a lot about Michigan, which I put on here, and then the California schools, because I know that we, US NWP is US News and World Report. Now, I will say this. This was not information that we compiled from any one source, and you can see there's a lot of footnotes around it, because I went into each of their individual collective bargaining agreements. I went to their individual graduate assistant pages. I went to, So in some cases, the information may have, been, may have been from this year. Sometimes their latest update was last year. Sure. If they didn't have an updated CBA, it may be changed now. So keep that in mind, and you're welcome to independently verify anything that I've, I found up here. But I think what's interesting is when you look at, and the, the COL number, which is in that, that third row there, that's from that MIT, that's from the MIT model. So that adjusts the, um, that adjusts the, the stipends. And then the in-state for undergrad and grad is, on, I couldn't fit all the out-of-state on here, so I have that on a different slide for you to consider. But obviously, when you look at Berkeley and you look at UCLA, I mean, they actually just settled for 50. It was 45. They just actually settled at 50. But when you put it in the context of the cost of living, it's not really 50,000. It's 31,188 or 34,667. Here's the thing that I found the most interesting about their CBA. When you look at their tuition assistance, it's not guaranteed in their contract. And I'm gonna show you where later on, that makes a huge thing. The most important thing about the California GA, because they actually have a statewide GA contract, at least in my reading of it, here's, and it's down here in the footnote, remission is not guaranteed at the in-state rate for GAs. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because they, they charge them a premium of $15,000 if they are a non-research GA, meaning if they teach and they don't do research, if they're not on like a soft money research, they can't get the in-state rate. They have to pay the out-of-state rate, which means you could take that 31000 and go ahead and subtract that $15,000 premium, which, which matters because it puts it all in a very, very different context. Uh, again, I put Virginia and Michigan on there because they were it's tied for one, tied for three, tied for five. We're tied with UNC. UNC was very interesting for my in, in my analysis just because... They actually did very poorly compared to us. But the thing that I also found was interesting was there's some interesting stuff and I didn't understand all of it. I'm just gonna be honest. They're located in small cities. The out-of-state funding appeared to be severely limited. In other words, their composition seemed often not like ours and that they have a lot of in-state uh, compared to out-of-state, but I couldn't verify that on their demographics page. 
um, but clearly they pay a lot less. And then the comparators to the right are ones that UF acknowledges or that we, when we do our comparison work, these are ones that we often look at. Um, University of Texas, Austin, Georgia Tech, and then University of Georgia. And what we found, which was interesting was when you do the adjustment for cost of living, we actually thought that Georgia actually fares better than the other comparators, especially because they actually provide the tuition assistance. Now where they fall down is the health insurance because they don't actually pay the health insurance. They only pay 50% of the premium and they have no paid family leave unless they get an individual waiver from the college. So why did, why did we put this all together? We put this all together because as we said before, you know, our interest is in being competitive. And I think that just looking at the, the number on Michigan of, you know, 35,000 to 11, or sorry, uh, you know, 24,054 is like, wow, you guys are completely out of whack and you're behind the pack. We think it's interesting in looking at it in terms of, you can't just look at one number. You've got to look at everything in context. So that's that. And like I said, we'll go ahead and, and share this with you. And you can independently verify it to, in whatever way you want. We did a deeper dive on Michigan. So this is, this is in a very simple sense. When you look at revenue generation, I think, I think that this is one of the things that is, that is very interesting, especially because in most cases, when you have a revenue issue, what you really want to do is if you're a private industry, you can adjust the inflows. We don't really have the ability to do that. Just look at, now we're about the same size. Look at the in-state undergrad tuition and fees, and then look at the out-of-state undergrad tuition and fees, and then look at the composition of in-state versus out-of-state. And then just in a very, very simple way, now this is not directly off a budget line. This is very, very high level revenues, right? This is not, I mean, their, their budgeting is exceptionally complicated, but just look at the difference. Just look at the difference in terms of undergraduate revenue, just an undergraduate revenue, 270 million, versus 1.3 billion for a similar sized institution in terms of undergraduate. Mm -hmm. That's not nothing. That's, that's a huge amount of difference. Um, what, about, what about graduate? So again, we have very similar number of graduate attendees um, in-state versus out-of-state. There's the in-state graduate tuition versus the out-of-state graduate tuition. Again, here, in-state, out-of-state is pretty similar, but you can again see the difference in terms of revenue generation. And then finally, um, you know, just the, just the overall. So, and, and I'll, I'll respond to Bryn. Bryn, it's relevant because you were the ones that wanted to look at Michigan. So if we're going to look at Michigan, then let's look at Michigan, which is what we're attempting to do. You picked Michigan. We didn't pick Michigan. Yes, so, I'm just wondering how the number of graduate attendees and the number of undergraduate um, class, I don't know, what was the other, uh, just the, the categories of data you used didn't seem the percentage of in-state and out-of-state students. I don't, don't see the relevance to how much you pay us. Well, I think it's massively relevant when you look at what they pay to attend. I think it's, it's, it's completely relevant because in some respects, what I was attempting to do was to juxtapose some of the ways in which they look very similar, but in other ways in which they are fundamentally different. And when you just say, hey, look, if you look at just these items, they look like they're the same as us. But then when you look at everything in context, there are some ways in which they are nothing like us. And we were never stating that they're exactly similar to us. But one thing that is irrefutable is our main argument being that University of Michigan has the most comparable cost of living to us, despite the revenues. And again, I, I know that this is a fundamental difference that your team has versus what our team has, but we are not responsible how the university generates revenue, where the money comes from, X, Y, Z. Yes, this is a compelling argument in that University of Michigan is magnitudes larger than us and has magnitudes larger amounts of funding than us, but it is not our responsibility to, it is the university's responsibility to secure funding. It has nothing to do with us. I get that. But if you want to make an argument that's predicated on social responsibility, then this is highly relevant. It's highly relevant because we don't just take, it's a social responsibility argument that you've made. We're trying to contextualize that in terms of actual money. The, I, I appreciate that you, that your position is, look, we don't have to care about anything else. All we care about is we know what we want and you've got to give it to us. We're not allowed to operate that way. We're not allowed to just say, well, fine, then we'll just do it. 
That's not that's not the way it works on our side of the table. And I appreciate that you don't want to learn any more about the budget and you think it's a waste of your time. It is a waste of my time, but we did put time in to look at your budget. And what we did find was that you guys have a net gain over time. Like, can you pull up the, the document? Actually, sure. let's just wait until they're done presenting. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to waste time. So we'll we'll get back to that and talk about the bargaining unit size difference. And the bargaining unit size difference? Yeah, we can talk about that. I mean, I don't know if they're going to, I don't, again, I don't know if it, it, they, they say they don't care. No, but I'm wondering, again, how many are GAs versus graduate students? Because those are very different numbers as well. Yeah, that's the this bargaining unit size. Oh, the bargaining, bargaining unit size. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were looking at graduate no. students. No. Yeah, they fund yeah. half, um, a little more than half of the students that we do relative to the mm -hmm. population mm -hmm. and by our number. And relative to the budget. Yeah. Again, I will say also a big difference in the revenue is the fact that the legislature of the state of Florida has frozen tuition for UI. Right. That is something that's externally outside of both of our controls. Well, and and I think that's a that's a that's a good point, Rachel, because when you look at where was it? When you look at these these two slides, when you look at tuition and fees, I mean the bottom line is is that on the one hand, and I heard you guys say this last time, and it means well, they're giving a tuition waiver. So look mm -hmm. at the amount of their tuition waiver. Well, think about the think about the the folks, think about the folks that aren't in the bargaining unit mm -hmm. that are part of this 15,000 that are paying that enormous fee in terms of what that generates for the university to then use for operational expenses. I mean, it's it's a fundamentally massive difference. So, and then um, there was some there was some comparisons. I, I think you guys had mentioned both USF and UCF. So we went ahead and looked at all 12 um, SUS. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the ones that we know is is outdated, and I'll just say that we know that the FAMU one is outdated. I actually contacted their chief bargainer. They're, they haven't put a new CBA that I can find online since 2015, so that one's really outdated, so I just know that that's out. Um, we know the USF stuff is updated. What's interesting is some of them across the state actually do a split. So while the starting pay for USF is higher for a doctoral student, they actually split it between master's students yes. and doctoral students. So you can see that the 19000 is higher but they don't pay their master's students uh, in the same. And then you can, again, just look at what's, what's different across the, across the state. Um, and I think that we, frankly, we compare very well when you would go through all of, go across the state. And again, we normally wouldn't compare what we're doing with what it's doing across the state necessarily, but for your own edification, here it is. And again, you're welcome to independently verify any of that stuff. So here is one of the things that, um, and we realize you guys are not gonna wanna see this, um, but we're going to put it up here because we think it's pretty part and parcel to the way that we're doing this analysis of whether or not it's a competitive wage. So when we talk about the starting pay, currently what you're going to see here is what the, the annual stipend or salary is, and then the hourly equivalent, and then with the tuition waiver and how many hours get worked. So again, back to that slide where we talked about the 2080 versus the 800. When you look at it on an hourly basis, the, the pay for a GA is either 2125 or 3190 at the starting rate. Um, the cost of a postdoc on a twelve um, on a on a twelve month contract is twenty two eighty three, which is actually less on an hourly basis than a GA is now. And frankly, the hourly equivalent without the tuition waiver is actually approaching it. And then lecturer, assistant professor, and then your proposal. We just wanted to put it in context in terms of where it is. Um, we just think it's it's wildly out of it's wildly out of black. Um, wildly out of whack, which what, what we pay across the organization. I have a question about the postdoc numbers. All mm -hmm. postdocs are at 1.0 FTEs. No, assuming that's again, I did it apples to apples. That's because I did it on an hourly basis. So yes, that's, a know, 12 you, month, full, that's a twelve month. That's a twelve month full because I put the hours at the bottom. Yes. So that's if they're a twelve month. That's what I'm asking. That's a twelve month. Okay. Month, yeah, twelve month one FTE. I was gonna say because I'm not I'm not familiar with very many postdocs that are 1.0 FTE because postdocs are usually to get you prepared to go onto the job market again right. next year. So yeah. that's why I was but asking. They, they were they were all yes. all different kinds yes. of ways, so I had to annualize yes. it okay. just that's so that fine. they could see it because that's why I put the hourly up there. So. That's that's what we had to sort of show you today. Um, and again, I, I realize that a lot of that is stuff that you don't necessarily think that you should have to look at. I appreciate that. But these are these are the pieces of information that we're looking at and examining. So. Do you guys want a minute to talk to your person before they present? Well, there was someone here who wanted to speak who was an international student, I believe. Yeah. Um, I actually want to speak about the slider you just showed us about international student requirements to have some financial guarantee to get to the United States visa to enter the US. That requirements only applies to international students who pay out of pocket 
through their tuition and living expenses. But who are sitting here? Graduate students who has a teaching or research mm -hmm. position. So the basic assumption under that is we will have a wage that are sufficient to afford our living in the United States. And for me, I don't need like uh, to get a new United States uh, F1 students visa. I don't need any financial like, requirements to show that I have that amount of money. I need to show that zero because we have a tuition waiver and we have a monthly wage for nine months to support. So that you can also probably um, get an answer from the international student office. That in all, I am not I twenty forms. We don't need to have that financial like, guarantee to show that you have to have that amount of money to support outside in the United States. And even if we follow your logic, that we should have that amount, the financial guarantee to show that we can support ourselves. But usually, that amount of money for international students comes from their parents. So. We work for the UF, and you require that our parents afford our living here. And I don't think that's a compelling argument. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We had a few um, documents that we wanted to also share. Just the. My, my laptop's old, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So one of the main arguments that you guys had mentioned in your presentation was again, com considering that GAs are a part-time employee. And when we look across the board of all of our comparators within UF, specifically looking at their part-time appointments, let me see this, Rachel. Oh, sorry, no, it's okay. This column, so we have our different types of employees here at UF shown on the left where we have assistant professors, associate professors, et cetera. And then we have folks who are doing similar job responsibilities to teaching assistants down below with lecturers and instructors. And no matter what way you put it in the same way that you did your apples to apples comparison, when looking at specifically the 0.5 FTE or the half time appointment, the same language that you have used part time work, the lowest paid employee is still at 26.5. So this is to say that graduate students are making less for doing these same responsibilities as instructors when considering part-time work. Our entire income is based off of this. And even though we are considered 20 hour employees, it still doesn't justify paying us wages where we can't afford to live. I, I think we would reject the premise that to draw an equal sign between a university instructor and a GA, I, I think we would reject. They're not necessarily equal, to, so to say, but we have very similar, if not the same responsibilities where we are teaching classes with hundreds of kids, creating coursework, grading coursework, not to mention the work that we already have to do for our own research and our own coursework. Our part-time work here to teach, I would say isn't one for one, but we are teaching in the same way yes. that a professor or an instructor or a lecturer is teaching. Rachel, who is going to graduate soon, is applying for what? An instructor position? Assistant or an professor position. Assistant professor but position. Once you so, have your... Once you're done. But also, I could teach once you have college your, right now with a master's degree. PhD. Right, yeah. you absolutely could. The other thing I would add is that I absolutely am doing the same work as an instructor. I am listed as the instructor of record of all my courses. I design all of my own courses. I teach my courses. I am solely responsible. So why am I not being paid at the same level as an instructor for my courses? Yeah, I, for the part-time work. These people are making work. double of what Do we are making. Do all these people have graduate degrees already? No idea. Well, I think the assumption is that if you're going to be a... So if they have a degree, it's okay I think, well, I to think not exploit it, them, but because we don't have our degree yet, we should be paid less than them for doing the same I'm amount of I'm saying you have different qualifications. If you if these people have already earned their PhD, then they are making a little bit more than a graduate assistant who ha doesn't have a PhD to do the same amount of work. It's a and different the same position. Kind of work. It's a different position. It's, so you're not doing the same exact work. Uh, I would say that an instructor in UWP, me teaching as an instructor of in UWP, are doing the exact same work. And then, but, so yeah, then you're asking for essentially a lecturer and you want to be paid more than them though. That's not because what I'm no. saying. I'm saying that the well, lowest... you're saying they're they're right, if I'm reading this correctly, that their salary is twenty six thousand. Sure. Yeah. And you're asking for half for, time. For half you're, time. And you're asking for a minimum stipend of twenty seven thousand for a minimum? That was for twelve months. That was our most recent offer. Okay. So you're asking to be paid almost the same as the yes, instructor. The same work that I'm doing should be paid who has different qualifications than mm -hmm. you. Okay. Just a clarification. The university school 
I don't know what those are. <laughs> these are classes that were listed just on the <laughs> state university. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 we weren't sure entirely yeah. what those were. Yeah, so those are K-12. Right. Um, if I'm understanding the job title correctly, yeah. that's PK Young. Anything else? Yeah, I think the equivalent would be an adjunct on, or maybe lecturer. Lecturer, lecturer or instructor yeah. are the non-tenure track yeah. positions. Yeah, the instructor is um, probably the adjunct, right? Okay. I'm going to guess. Oh, no. The instructor is a full faculty member of some college. Regardless of what the specificities of each class is, it is clear that GAs are still making below every other class of employee on this campus. We can actually, if we can, and, and we, we don't, that's true. Yeah, we don't yeah. disagree with that because they're, I mean, it's a different position. I, and I understand it's not what you want to hear, but you're going to go get your graduate degree and go get a great job in academia and you're going to get paid more. But again, I think the, the idea graduate. that eventually we're going to make a living wage does not, there's no reason like, for those why do we, things to exist separately. There's no reason why we should. Well, you're primarily here to be a graduate student. Correct. Yeah. You came to the university. It's half, half my work is work. Uh, so I would say I, it's a 50 50 split. But my point is, the reason you are here at the University of Florida mm -hmm. in Gainesville, Florida, mm -hmm. is because you applied to a graduate program here mm -hmm. to sure. become a graduate mm -hmm. student and to earn a graduate degree. Which can't exist without working. No, but mm -hmm. let me finish. Go ahead. So that is the reason that you are here. You applied to come here. You applied to get this degree at the University of Florida. And there are costs associated with obtaining that degree. There are different ways that a person who is getting a graduate degree can cover those costs, mm -hmm. one of which is becoming a graduate assistant. Well, I mean, for international students, there's one way to do it. One of which is becoming a graduate assistant, mm -hmm. which is a part-time job. You are a graduate student primarily, mm -hmm. and you're a part-time graduate assistant. And that is a part-time job, and there was never a guarantee mm -hmm. in any regulation, in any CBA, in any document that I've seen from the graduate school that guarantees that your part-time job is going to cover all costs associated with obtaining your graduate degree. Right, but in our CBA, And if you see that, mm -hmm. then please show that to me. We absolutely I, I would will. like to see that, but, but I'm not aware of that. How else are grad students then expected to make up these additional costs to live? Our CBA, in, in the opinion of University of Florida, our CBA explicitly says that it is up to the department whether or not graduate students can, domestic graduate students can pursue external income. So we are leaving it up to the departments to decide if domestic students who cannot cover their cost of living and cannot cover their degree can work. For international students, it's even worse because again, they cannot work. So this, for all intents and purposes, is our only source of income. It is our only job. And, and, and so I guess you have to have any comments on how people can fund graduate degrees. But by paying us more. Fire. I mean, for international students, they literally cannot. They are not eligible for grants. There are things like there aid. are things that I know people don't like to talk about, and those yes. things are called scholarships and fellowships and loans, which are incredibly well. No, no, for international students, they cannot get okay. loans. Okay, inside the international student, we can't. Set aside. No, no, no. Just, just, just for the general purpose of discussing sure. where we're coming from. Sure. Okay. Yes, I know. I don't want you to take that wrong. I don't. We're not setting them aside. Clearly, we're interested in them, which is mm -hmm. why we looked at the youthic information. I just think for the purpose of you understanding our logic, because mm -hmm. I want, because I feel like there's, everyone's like, what's the relevance of this? There's, there's a logic to this. Yes. So I just, it's hard for the university to hear you say that we are responsible for funding your entire education when there was no promise made for that. And there are other avenues. It's not our education. We're your graduate degree, our job, your, our you, degree as our, our existence as students versus our existence as university employees is separate. It's a separate thing. And what we're discussing here is the stipend that supports us from the work we do for so, the university yeah. separate that's, from our degree. Yeah, right. So that, so it is just for the work that you are doing. Yes. And that is why we pulled up that last slide to show how we are compensating other people at the university who engage in similar work, but who already have their graduate degrees to show you that we are paying you similarly in what we consider to be a fair wage compared for the work that you are doing, which is a part-time position to teach and perform research that will give you experience and background to help you when you obtain your graduate degree, which is the primary focus of your time here at University of Florida. 
and the reason that you are here. I, I mean, I still you did not love, come here to become a graduate assistant. I mean, I do love teaching. That's why I specifically applied for a teaching assistantship. And I would say it's hard to say that our primary duty when literally you have to find me as a halftime. So I would say they're equal proportion. I'm equally a worker as much as I am a student in the eyes of the University of Florida based on the FTE. This was different when I came in at a 0.33, in which case I was primarily a student. I would also just say like the, the, the this is the main problem is that the University of Florida um, has done nothing to support graduate students in any other way. The cost of living for Varsity House, do you know how much it's going to be this fall for a one bedroom or a studio a month? $1,060 a month. If you're at the minimum, just adding in your insurance, which you have to have as a student at the University of Florida, and your rent to live on UF campus housing, which is cheaper than the actual market, that leaves you $3,776 a year for every other cost. That's even less if you're a domestic student, you have, uh, an international student, you have to have dependents. So all I'm saying is that, yes, you're absolutely right. I, I, I've received one fellowship, but my fellowship didn't come with uh, insurance. But and it didn't come. GA, in the, and we, that is one of the things that we are, we offer healthcare as part of our GA program. Yes. So there's nothing prohibiting you from getting a scholarship or a loan or anything on top oh, I've of- Oh, I've got loans. I, I never had loans. I went got through my entire um, undergraduate um, and my master's without loans. But we never, but now we I have never made loans. any kind of guarantee to graduate- No, you're right. That you you could make it through on this amount. No, and I'm just saying- And that you would not be have to get a loan or a scholarship. Right. So when you're saying to us, we're forcing you to live in poverty, there's no, no other way to fund what we're, to fund our education- I don't think that's accurate. And that's not that's not a reality. All I'm saying is that if you want to be competitive and have people come here, you're gonna to have to pay them enough to live. Well, I mean, so, so again, to I call this competitive, competitive, you are not competitive if that gives an entire analysis compared to all that these other That sounds entities, fantastic because they're and, all underpaying. Just because they are underpaying and you are underpaying does not mean that you're not underpaying. But that's who we're competing with, right? Right, so it's either we're competitive or we're not. Either we're competitive or we're not competitive. No, because here's, so, $4,000 a year to live on for electricity is, is, is not an ability to live. And again, I think you guys are, are misunderstanding how difficult it is to get these grants and these fellowships, even internal ones. They're incredibly competitive when you have 15,000 graduate students applying for 20 a year. And also many of them that would actually provide a living wage, like the NSF, NIH, uh, I don't know if Fulbright if it offers like graduate assistantships, fellowships or whatever, um, but they're not, sorry, no, no, they are not available for international students. I know you want to like build this like logic by excluding international students, but you can't do that if part of your employee base is going to be international students. Like you can't build a logic by excluding international students and then be like, well, our logic doesn't really apply for them. Like you have to. Do you have a breakdown of what percentage of international students are making the minimum stipend versus making above the minimum stipend? No, because we aren't able to see who are international students. We don't have access to that. That would probably be a FERPA violation for us to have access to that. You you could pull your your you could ask your we could your survey your we could. Your I mean, I, we know department. that we know that a, uh, that over a thousand GAs, um, so over a quarter, about a quarter are Chinese nationals. So it's a good percentage, but I'm again, just, as the minimum, I have yeah, no idea. I'm that just wondering if, self if the international students are, are one of your interests, which I think we'll yes. add to our list now, mm -hmm. is, is there something else? I mean, is there, is there a certain, can we identify what the particular interest and issue is regarding to the, to the, the international students? Yeah. Rather than giving a blanket minimum stipend raise to everybody when you're what you're telling me is that really the ones who are most affected by this yes. are your international students we're all effective negatively negatively but it's worse for international but, students but, but I you're think telling me that there's like nothing an international student else they can do where they except, can't, except they can't their get families for money. Money. which which is it sounds different than what you're saying somebody who's not they're different but yes. they're both okay. bad so that's that's just what i'm trying to understand well i mean i would say is, is you are the all that have the access to in, whether they're international their visa status and their pay. We don't have access to all of that information. So that would have to be done on your end. Okay, we can right. look at that. We can look at that. But, but if they're getting a scholarship from their home country, which some do. Some do. Um, and also Fulbrights, they do. They cross mm -hmm. share with the department. So a lot of our, uh, I can't, I don't have data. I don't want to misspeak. Our incoming Fulbrights mm -hmm. have 
various amounts of funding through their home yeah. country in Fulbright, which does include a partial health insurance. When they come here, typically the department's cost share to increase that stipend, which is meeting minimum, well above minimum, and they supplement with two types of insurance, the one that the Fulbright agency will help pay, as well as ours as well. So that in, in essence is how some of our international students but I think getting more data pool and possibly pulling your students would be helpful um, to see because they are also offset by the country and the country of origin also determines the different amounts. Mm -hmm. So they're very different. And then I do believe you think if you have a graduate assistantship and you're an international student, you do have to show it and come off that cost of whatever they require, I believe, but I can follow up with Martha. Um, but I think that's because that's how they've done it recently with when I've given them information um, that they take it off of that. Like, so if it's 17,000 annually, they'll take that off of 15 because they have to show it every year that they have a contract to, to be included in that amount. I don't think it's white clean, but I can follow up because I don't process that. So, yeah, I think all of that being said, I think it, it goes back to the central point that a nine month. 0.50 FTE GA works 38.5% of what the basic MIT standard cost of living person makes. And on an hourly basis, on an hourly basis, you guys, all the minimum is already significantly over what that would be. And to assume that we're going to bring a proposal now or any time in the future that is going to include the work that would be required to support a full-time sole person working in a household at 2,080 hours a year when that person's only working 800, we are so far apart in terms of not just the numbers, forget what the numbers are, but the philosophical approach to how we're constructing our offer. Like, I feel like we have to address that or we, we're going to keep, we're going to keep going back and forth. We're never going to make progress. But like, okay. So you're, you're basically telling us that because we are part-time, we don't, the serve to make the living wage what we need to live in Gainesville currently. No, that's not what I'm you saying. Are, at all. You, the, are you are paying the living you, wage, is what he's saying. Based no, on, we're not. No, no, no. We're based only on a getting paid. based on a 0.5 FTE. But here's but we're here's only based getting, on a point five FTE. It's already at the living wage. If you guys want to talk about the living wage number, then the number for a 0.5 FTE hourly wage is already being earned by GA. So it's not compelling to us that that's the argument you because we don't believe that we're paying you below the living wage. You can't just the data like, acknowledge that. that we cannot, that many of us, most of us cannot get another source of income to supplement that and say that we are earning a and living it's, wage. It's not just international students. We have several domestic GAs whose departments do not allow them to get external funding. It's not just an international yeah. student issue. It is an all GA issue yeah. because we're leaving it up to the department because it's not centralized. It's the university. Yeah. Yeah. That's what do you I mean? mean when you say that you don't allow them to get other external funding? Because they're you, so don't, no, I'm sorry. Go let, ahead. Sorry. What what is your definition of other external? They funding? cannot get a job outside of their okay. research position without risking losing their research assistant. So another job is what you're saying. Another so, job, yeah. which is your guys' Which is what nobody's of. asking you to do. But I'm saying- No one's asking us to do it. But, we but what you're saying, I just want to make sure I understand when you say other external job. funding, you're saying another job. Another job or anything in the university. We obviously, if we're working 20 hours, that's our limit as a graduate student. We're talking about we can't get another university job because we are not allowed to. It's not in the bounds of what we're allowed to do. We're also not allowed to get jobs outside of UF. Your argument is that Nothing is stopping us from getting another job. And that's not what I said. That is that's not what I said. You said it's what said, you're implying. I said, it is what no, you're no, no, implying. No. What I you want to know when I'm implying, sure, is not that you should get another job, is that what I'm saying is that there are other sources of funding. Okay? Yes, and other than another job, and that there was never a guarantee that your GA position would fund your entire cost of attending the grad graduate to get your graduate degree here. So then how do you calculate stipends? What is the point of a stipend if it's not to meet this your minimum cost? what costs? we're telling you when we are looking at, we look at all different types of things. Uh -huh. Some of the things we primarily were looking at were comparators for other institutions to ensure that we're competitive. Yes. Which is what we spent a lot of time looking at. And uh -huh. I think our analysis of that is that 
we fall pretty well in the middle. Yes. And then the other thing we're looking at is how the 0.5, the work mm -hmm. that you're providing mm -hmm. on a part-time mm -hmm. basis and how that compares to other mm -hmm. people at the university. Mm -hmm. Well, and, all, and when I look at mm -hmm. the last slide that Patrick put together, the hourly equivalent without factoring the tuition waiver currently of a GA is twenty one twenty five an hour, and a postdoc is twenty two eighty three. Okay, but so this is, so so you asked my question. You asked a yes, question. Yes, yes, yes. I'm trying and, to. And, there, and there's two. There, we look at mm -hmm. what's competitive mm -hmm. outside of the university. Yes, and what's fair and comparable within the university. Well, and when we look at those two numbers. Fair. When we look at those two numbers, mm -hmm. where the numbers are currently is within those bounds. So and what we're when we're getting a, an offer from the GA that when we make the hourly equivalent of would come to 3281, mm -hmm. that doesn't really that's like as Patrick said, that's not we're not speaking the same language. No, my question was this is all work that has been done very recently, which seems to me, and again, this is my opinion, has been done to justify what the stipend is. How was the stipend originally designed when it was implemented to start paying GAs? What set the stipend? Because it wasn't based on comparators, especially not on Michigan, because we weren't even top 10 or top 20 or top 30 at that point. So you're, again, you're talking about recent decisions of recent research to show why the stipend is what it is. I'm talking about when the stipend was in envisioned and put into place. Like back in the late 80s? I, I, I no and, it's, and it's not, <laughs> so, but again, nor is it, nor I, is it relevant. I, I disagree because if you're saying that they were like, well, come here. I'm and talking we'll about now when you're, you're, you brought us a proposal. Yes. And when we are looking at your proposal for you to now start earning what is the equivalent of $32.81 mm -hmm. an hour, but our when they, is irrelevant. Just, it is relevant to our analysis. And you're asking how we're doing our analysis. And I'm explaining to mm -hmm. you how we're part of the way we're doing our analysis. And when we look at that, that is not within the bounds of when we're looking at the other range of other employees at the university, mm -hmm. nor does it seem to fit within the competitive. I mean, yes, that would make us incredibly competitive, but we have to balance that with what our revenue is. That's fine. My question so is what was, goes into our decision making. My question was. What is the stipend? Why was it envisioned if not to actually pay people enough to live? And I'm sorry that you don't think it that wasn't envisioned to spread. pay to pay the entire cost it's of your degree. Yeah, the the other offset, the part time job. Of paying the full way, and this is a benefit that we're seeing is offsetting. I mean, that's when I went to grad school. That's what I looked at. I'm like, I'm either going to pay my own, own way, or if I get an assistantship, it's going to help. And not pay I mean, we. Your argument is very similar to what Ryan Fuller said last semester, last semester, last year. Last year. And he gave us a stipend. And when counting for inflation, yeah. it was a living wage. The, yeah, it was a living wage. The thing is, like, yeah. you, the amount of money that is today, maybe it's the same or very no. similar amount of, of money. It does. It's not worth the no. same. No, it's no. not right. Inflation is worth taking into account. I mean, I think that is something, but we don't control it. And, no. and you were asking about original. Sorry, I was going no. back to the nineties. No. That's my earliest. No, no. no. I mean, but I think I think that's the point. Like, I I don't understand why. Um, again, that sounds great, but you're essentially saying that unless you are some of the top 1% right. and eligible for fellowships, which some of us are, right? right. I received the Ruth McCann Fellowship from uh, Women and Gender Studies. It's one of the most prestigious ones at the University of Florida. And even still, I had to get myself almost $20,000 into debt to attend here. Right. So you're saying that to become a, to be a graduate student, a graduate assistant at the University of Florida, you really need to do, put yourself into debt, have, it, have rich parents, um, which essentially is one of the most elitist arguments I've ever heard. I did not say we that. Say Nobody that. said that. <laughs> The thing is, like, you have the choice and an option, and this is, I this is, you, you, you chose to come here to I get did. a degree. I did. Your I choice did. is not <laughs> a good <laughs> choice for people that to are, come to a top five that university. Come, it was not top five when I was here. To get a PhD, and to go on and do wonderful things, because we know you're going to. But again, I genuinely believe like, that. Like the argument is here. that you have to, it, it almost feels, and again, it almost feels like hazing like suffer through grad school so that eventually you can make a living wage. And that just feels, feels cruel to me. And again, maybe this would be different if you had people who were supplementing your income, but I don't. I'm a first generation college student uh, with no living parents who, as a matter of fact, is actually sometimes financially helping her sister who is chronically disabled. 
Like there is no support system. And for me, we view education as a way to a better life. It's not a choice because for me, the choice is poverty, a slow death through poverty in the American system or getting an education that's gonna make me have a living wage. So it didn't really feel like a choice. And I chose UF because UF paid me the most. Again, I know that might sound cold. UF paid me more than any other grad school where I was offered admission and assistantship. That is what students care about. And students aren't gonna come here on $17,000 a year minimum. So that's how I feel. Somebody wants to say something about sure, can, maybe can we please get the PowerPoint that Patrick used? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll send it. Thanks. If you can share it in the chat so we can see it too. I forgot I was sharing. Sure. That I also good. want to say that it's you're presenting this argument in terms of like, you know, we're only working part time, but we have evidence that you're working other people that are working part time or even less than 0.5, way, way more than we're asking yeah. for. So it's not a matter of how many hours we're working is how much you're valuing the work that we're putting in. And it just seems that UF is not appreciative at all of like the work that graduate assistants are doing. And I think it's not a good like look, not a good look to like undervalue um, our jobs here. I think the assumption that we're going to pay a 2,080 hour a year living wage based on employees that only work 800 hours a year is it's we're going to remain at pretty significant loggerheads at infinitum because we have many employees who don't work, who, who do work 2,080 hours a year. And to say that we're going to make up all that difference for this one group of employees is going to be very unlikely. Okay, but this is a, a bargaining process. So you have to bring something to the table. And right now, what you have brought is not even, you, you haven't moved from, from 17. So if you're saying you don't, you can't meet the full time, give us what you, you can offer and we can go from there. I don't think that would be proven. And let me explain why. I assume that's Austin, but I'm not sure. No, that was um, Robert. Robert. He's oh, okay. one of our... Um, yeah. Okay, so here, here's here's why. Because I we believe, and I said this last time, we believe that the... I'm going to be very meta about the process here for a second. So we believe that GAU came out and established an absurd anchor so that they could effectively put all of the subsequent offers in terms of that anchor. The reason we went through this today is because we actually reject your premise. The premise of the way you've established your offer is one that we reject. And the reason we think it's important to do that is because we're not going to be putting all of our subsequent offers in the context of the offer you made because we reject what it's predicated upon. And we think it's important to be honest with you about that rather than saying, oh, well, you asked for 38,000 or 36,000. So we'll quote unquote, and even one of your, I can't remember who said it last time, but you have to meet us somewhere from where you started. It's important that we say out loud that we reject your premise and we reject your first offer, not based on the number itself, but on the way you arrived at it. And the reason we feel that's important is because without getting some agreement in terms of what we're going, how we're going to do this, it's, it's going to be a much longer process. And it's going to come down to, we're going to keep our premises and you keep your premises and we're going to remain massively far apart. And that premise being that we... Knowing that graduate assistants cannot get another like source of income, a and I'm going to say that a significant portion of graduate assistants, because I would argue probably at least half or more are international students. Yeah. And because for your comment that we could get another source of income through scholarships or fellowships and all that, you know that those are competitive like nationwide or even internationally. So it's 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 not a given. You, we can't assume that the, that international, not even international students alone, but like other gr graduate assistants in general can access those sources of funding. You can't assume that. We You can't assume that we're going to be able to get another job. We can't just assume that the stipend that UF is providing is the sole source of income because that is most likely what is happening for most of us. You, your premise is that UF does not have the duty 
to ensure that their graduate assistants can actually live? That's not our premise. What is your premise? Our premise is we do not have a duty to cover all of the expenses associated with your graduate degree. But what about housing? What about on-campus housing? That's a, it's not related to this, what we're discussing right Yes, now. it is, because on-campus housing is the biggest portion of how we spend our Are you even gonna, is that going to be part of your I presented offer? on it earlier that, I mean. No, but I'm saying like, what, like, let's think nobody on this team is on housing. Like we don't have, none of us have the ability to affect but you do housing. recognize that like the lowest cost housing is a thousand dollars a month and that is UF's housing. So UF is acknowledging, and again, I don't know how they're coming up with that number. I don't know if they're coming it up through, you know, what the actual market is, but like you can't even expect your stipend to cover your housing costs. What is the stipend supposed to be covering then? Because again, because a 50% portion of the cost of obtaining your graduate degree. What is a portion? That's, I think, I've never, that's our portion, biggest question. It's not tuition because that's paid for. Of course, it's not your part fees. Of tuition and fees. It's not your fees because 105% of your fees are paid for that we that are for tuition. No, 105% of the health and transportation fee. That, we pay $500 that, that, are just, that are covered in the bargaining agreement. Yes. Okay. So it's not those. So then the money that you earn covers what you want it to cover. Okay, but it doesn't, okay. So do you understand okay. that the definition of rent burden is if more than a third of your salary goes to your housing costs? And the definition of severely rent burden is if over 50%. And again, as I just Is that based on a salary of somebody who makes- It's based on, is, it's based on total it income. Based I, on the salary of somebody who is making, working full-time? It's based on a salary. That is a different yeah. discussion. No, no, it isn't. That, that's that as much money as I make. a part-time employee. Yeah. Here's I don't thing. think that anybody would say a part-time employee could potentially make, I mean, if somebody can, then I want to know what that job is, but can, can cover all of this, can cover all of it. They can. Yeah, um, they the, already... the administration that are at 0.5 make an average of $43,000 a year. Literally double. So yes, yes, they do. Okay. Because they get... they're expected at a 0.5 to be able to have enough to live and in the And the administration area. who has different qualifications mm -hmm. and different background yeah. and different experience and different job path and different. So but they're not expected for that. Valuing the so job that we're doing. Ask you one? It's not a matter. We're talking about graduate students. You are graduate students. Your primary job here, your no. primary position here is a graduate 50 student. Fifty percent of our position. You have here. a part-time position as a graduate mm -hmm. assistant to help pay for those costs, and that is the premise that we mm -hmm. are operating from, and you are operating mm -hmm. from a different premise. And the whole point of what Patrick is saying is that. We are so far yes. apart in terms of yes. what our premises are that uh -huh. we could be sitting here for two more hours okay. and we're still never going to see eye but, to eye. But here's the problem. So bargaining means yes. we have to figure out what's yes. important. I hear a lot today about international students. Yes. We're going to do some looking into that. International okay. students at the minimum. Those are our primary concerns and we've been saying that since Okay. Before. So, but you can't come to us with a minimum that is $26,000 minimum and then expect us to just say, yep, that's what we that think makes sense. That is not what we expected. Well, then why did you, you to give then why did you come, well, then this is, well, that, yes, that's, and I'm but this is exactly what, what Patrick just said. You can't we come in an and, make, you make, and, make a, and make a $26,000 minimum stipend offer mm -hmm. and then expect us to anchor all of our counter offers That is not that. what we are doing. But that's, that's bargaining, what we are right? value. That's bargaining, that, you know, we, okay. We have an offer of what we believe we are valued. And I am sorry that you don't believe that we are valued that. It's, that is where our okay. difference, if you, where our if, if you have a, if you're telling me right now, which I've been at a lot of mediations and agreements and I, I, I understand, right? That nobody usually comes in with their best offer, right? Like you don't, otherwise, and we have why? Opposing so interests, like, so that's why if there's, that. if you're acknowledging right now that we didn't really want 26, we knew you weren't going to give us 26. No, that's what we want. Then if we want this to be, you might want that, but I think I think what I'm hearing is you knew we weren't going to accept that. Well, well there's based a, off yeah. of your attitude and how so, you yeah. yeah. So, so, so that's what I'm saying is, moving. but but we need something better to work from than 26 because that is just so far I'm from so what is in our world that, that's that we and and we did come before. back with an offer. Okay, we did and come back. No increase in the minimum at all. That was no increase in the minimum. Okay, because that is not what our priority is right now. Why is okay. it? So our so, priorities are not going to be that's why we could come to the bargaining table to to negotiate something that's 
partly acceptable to both parties. Right. Our, we're not going to agree on our premises. Those are just different. But we need to come to an agreement despite having uh, different premises. If we spend every bargaining session trying to uh, uh, have a unified premise, like that, that's just not going to happen. What's going to end up happening is we're not going to have a negotiation, mm -hmm. and you're going to think that we're we're just going to end up having these uh, ridiculous debates and not actually come to an agreement. They're not. They're not ridiculous yeah. debates, Sikander. They're yes, not. I don't. I don't think they're not, we're not, you, you are saying that uh, it's not your obligation to cover all our expenses. You don't want to say what what the alternative to that means because obviously that means like some someone has to cover those expenses. Either it's going to be. Uh, your parents, if your parents can afford it, or you're going to get a different job, or you're going to go into debt. Those are really the only options. So you don't want to talk about that because, uh, because I don't think that, we didn't say we didn't want to talk about that. I think that's what we've been talking about. I think that's time. what we've been talking about. So okay. essentially, what you're saying is it, it's okay uh, that for your stipend, the the majority of the type of graduate student that can come here is either wealthy already, or that they have to take on debt. That that's essentially the the only options that 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 you have, and that that um, that is. Uh, I think it's an unfortunate reality of of higher education and and the world that we live in. I'm not going to get into. I'm still paying off my student loan debt, so yeah, I, we're I trying feel to make you. It a, I feel you. Reality. Okay, yeah. I I feel you, but I'm just saying, and it's and 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 it's like I haven't wanted to say that because it's not fair, right? But but that is not. We can't make an offer based on a world where this isn't a reality. How does that okay, square yeah. with your diversity, equity, yes. and statement? Like does, at all. What do you mean? How does it not square? How does it, not how does it, square, it, how does it square? Because if you're saying that the reality of this institution is that it can only admit Wealthy students. That's not, that's what, not I what, said, what she said. That's not what I said. It's not what she said. Poverty. Then that's not. That's not what she said. It's not what you said. But that is the other thing. Yeah. Well, that's not what I said. But isn't it? Yeah, you don't want to say it's not that, that's the obvious. And you said that is the reality of it. Like the, it the, the, the reality just, and implication are two different things. Okay. The fact is, we cannot pay enough. We're not going to be able to pay, and we're not going to come back with an offer of a stipend that is going to cover everything that is associated with the what a fifty thousand dollar cost associated with getting your graduate degree. Okay, I also and there was never a guarantee that that would be the case. No one's saying that it's a guarantee, but it's something that we deserve. And I also do want to address what UF can and can't afford because you guys have been very straightforward about us needing to spend more time looking into the budget. Although I've said that's not our job. Based off of your last proposal, let me share this with you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, that's not Zoom. Okay. Based off of your last proposal, when we break down how much UF would have to spend when taking away fee relief for the first year, UF is only shelling out $1.4 million to implement your most recent proposal. $1.4 million for 4,400 GAs, respectively. How is that fair? How is that a reasonable offer? Austin mentioned last session how much how the net increase. Let me actually just stop sharing. He, he also that. included he also included the acquisition of scripts, which is not that's a balance sheet number that he looked at. I mean, it, it it's not right, exactly half of that. Yeah. 2021 <laughs> to 2022 fiscal reports between 21 and 22 respectively, the university had an 8.4 fiscal increase. That's 421 million dollars, and you're only willing to to but shell out 1.4 million. It's not available years. cash. It's not operational income. That's total balance sheet value. It doesn't matter what the total balance. It does balance matter. I can't. I can't all rip week a brick out of scripts. In that. We're not saying that, but we're what, saying that the university has net increase in income, and none of that is being prioritized to graduate assistance. If you're only willing to shell out one million dollars for 4,400 people, when there's people at the university who are making one point something million dollars for one person. You're willing to shell out one person's salary for 4,400 people. Or $300,000 for Ben Sass School? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're seeing so that there are, are so many priorities? expenditures that are being, that are frivolous and that could be easily funneled into prioritizing graduate student stipends. Our argument, yeah, that's that's what I have to say. I, I just don't even know. So if, the, if we ignore like your you know illiquid assets, like how much is what's the increase in your revenue in comparison to your costs? The net up, we'll, I can get you that number if you want to be the net sure, operation. Also, when sure. specifically looking at employee compensation and benefits, the university decreased 
between 2020 and 2021, sorry, 21 and 22, by $25 million. If you're not spending $25 million on other employees, where is it going? It could be funneled into graduate student stipends. We're just saying that, that was, the money- That was also from 21, 22. It's not from 22, 23. Right, because- Which we actually had a net increase. 22, 23 went up. By how much? I can I, I don't remember exactly how much sure. I met with George. You could send that to me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, a lot of places currently have a hiring freeze at UF as well. Oh, well, no, mean, the numbers that she was- Oh, I see. But I mean, I know Center for Inclusion Multicultural Engage Engagement currently has a hiring freeze. So could you yeah. share those numbers that you just yeah mentioned? yeah there, yeah we'll get that out of the most recent report that Austin found online the PDF is available to... I think we should open up for public comments yeah um, because we're kind of running out of time I know that one of the bullet points on UF's presentation was to avoid town hall meetings but I don't think that we can do that because again our GAs are the people we represent and we're going to give them the time to speak it's not that you guys are bargaining with. 4,400 GA. Okay. We are the bargaining team and we represent them and speak for them, but we also allow them to speak their mind in these sessions. Because why don't why don't we give you 15 minutes and why don't you curate who's going to talk? Um, we agreed at no, um, that is not what we agreed to, Patrick. That's not what we agreed to. <laughs> we agreed to the remaining time at minimum 30 minutes being able for public comment. If you yeah, if if that upsets you, you guys are welcome to leave early. Nobody's upset. Okay. I was just saying we had it's 243. I was checking the time. Okay. Sure. So Kimberly's had her hand up for a while. Um, Kimberly, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, please feel free to. Hi. Um, sorry, I'm passionate in a, in a car, so hopefully you don't hear like the, the traffic in the background. Um, I had a question about the, I guess what I was hearing similar, or at least what I felt was a sort of like discussion of like, hey, like after you're out of UF, there's going to be, you know, like essentially like a reward, you know, like we're going to go and, and get our jobs and all this stuff. But I'm not sure if um, the bargaining team is aware of what's happening social politically and how that also affects overall our experience at UF. Um, I've had colleagues, I mean, we're literally being laughed at. Um, there's nicknames for our school. Um, we, as GAs, have to do a lot of overcompensation to ensure that we can be competitive because unfortunately, regardless of the numbers, other universities look at us um, disparagingly as really incompetent. And, Unfortunately, also with the social political climate that also affects our undergraduate students. Recently with the shooting of multiple people, you know, coming to somebody's door has affected some undergraduate students for me that were Uber drivers. And so it's sort of like extra sort of like time and care. And of course, a lot of these incidents are in Florida because of recent gun laws. So I guess I'm curious about whether or not the bargaining team is aware or cares about also these other elements that are also pretty overall. <laughs> so how that factors in our sort of part-time because I've been doing a lot of care work with our students because I'm sure hopefully they're aware of our counseling services here are pretty abysmal as well. Doesn't look like the bargaining team is going to respond. I'm but... sorry, I thought they were. Yeah, I, I... is she done? I mean, we're we're not going to make a comment on the comprehensive impact of the, the the wide nature of social issues that she just discussed. I mean, we we're not going to we're not going to make a we don't have a response to that at the bargaining table. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. So I asked a question about whether or not they put those awarenesses and sort of tenants around in some of the decision making that they have because that increases our workload and it also does bite into some job options that I guess they would probably suggest but they do not want to answer that question I just want to make that that's clear correct I'm asking that's about correct. like that's, no that's, that's not, not correct that's not the art, article clearly enumerates exactly how many hours per week you can work and since even in the short time I've been here I have facilitated numerous complaints from people working over their workload if you're working over your workload, you need to make your complaint known and we will deal with it. Okay, got it. But just to be clear, the workload is about particular social political efforts that UF is also perpetuating. 
I'm not going to confirm or deny that statement in, in the in the context you made it. I, it. It's so broad. I don't even know how to. I don't even know how it would begin to construct the response to that. Okay, I just want to make sure. Is last question is that a factoring in at all the social political climate in reference to the hours that we work and overall? There was a comment earlier about after we graduate that we'll have sort of like a grand tenue of like having occupations. Is that, are they, or is the bargaining team aware or literate about what's happening with UF and the social political climate? In terms of future job prospects? I, nope, that's not my question. Is the bargaining team literate about what is currently happening with the social political climate in the University of Florida? Yes. <laughs> okay, that is all. Okay, we had a, a comment in person, so we're just going to move in person for a moment. Yeah, um, I just have a question or comment, I guess, about something that I found kind of ironic. We're saying that we're coming in with these off opposing premises, but then we also reveal that, like, concepts that we know are not going to give us exactly what we believe we deserve. And you're saying that your premise is that you won't cover everything, which, when we really break those two down, are the same exact premise. We know you're not going to supply everything or not exactly asking to have that, but livable wages is not everything that happens in life, everything that comes up in life. That doesn't account for emergencies or car problems or living, livable wages does not account for emergencies, I guess mm -hmm. I would say. I don't have the expectation that emergencies are going to be covered or fun summer trips. That's everything. I don't have that assumption, but I have the assumption that a livable wage is provided. That's all I believe. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, okay, so we have two more comments online. Um, Latanya, if you want to unmute yourself. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. I know, um, I know these conversations can get a little tense, but I appreciate everyone participating in the back and forth of these conversations. And I wanted to bring to light a particular experience that maybe not everyone here is necessarily having, but it's something that as a graduate student, I'm experiencing. I was previously working and then I came back to university. I am out of the age range. That means that my parents can support me in ways, which means adding me onto their car insurance their vision insurance or their dental. These are not offered to me by the university. And the stipend that I'm making definitely does not cover any accident that could possibly happen to the one pair of medicinal glasses that I have left or anything like that, let alone a visit to a vision doctor. Um, just like the previous comment that was made, accounting for these emergencies that are a part of life that just so happen to happen these are some of the things that we could possibly experience on a day-to-day -day basis. These are also experiences that I have while being a student who is not on main campus, which means that I don't have access to the bus system. I don't have access to the University Student Health Care Center. Some of the students around me at the research center that I'm at are being driven to go get groceries by other students on their lunch break because we don't have access to get to some of these areas. Not to mention that the student housing that's available at my center is maximum allowed for you to stay in for six months. I'm a student who's looking at being here for another four years. The cost of living in the area that I'm in, a one bedroom apartment in this area is almost $1,900 if I wanna be within a driving distance for gas that I can afford to get here. And that's if I want to try and live alone. Even if, even if I was able to find a roommate, I would be looking at a situation where all of the students who are coming here are on the same timeline and time frame. I want to make my education at the University of Florida work. And I think what's being asked here by myself and a lot of these other students is for you to please help us to figure that out. What can the university do to help us find these solutions? I want my education to be my primary focus. I don't want to do what I did in undergrad, which is work 30 hours a weekend serving tables so that way I could try and cover everything and then trying to come into the lab tired. I know that's not what the university is expecting for any of us to do. And we're asking you to help us make sure that we don't have to do that. I want my education to be a priority. I want my experience at the university to be a priority. And I want to have that outcome that you guys are suggesting that I'm going to have, which is bearing the University of Florida name is going to be a game changer on my way to the job market. 
help me get there, help me find a way to get there. And that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing your time. Thanks. I appreciate it. Someone in the audience is on a time frame. So do we okay, want yeah. to? Sure, yeah. yeah. We have one person speaking from the audience. All, I want to say for all of us who have left, we are prioritizing this meeting because we have class in eight minutes and not only calling, right? Um, so thank you for people online who let me go first quickly. <laughs> um, I just want to quickly say in regards to the quantification of who we are and and the, the humanistic aspect of our appeal is that we work 800 hours and God, uh, it's more than that. Yeah. And we get paid what we get paid. And the state of Florida recognizes our wages in SNAP benefits mm -hmm. as being eligible for benefits, right? So the state of Florida, where we live, we're in a public university system. They recognize our wages as annual wages, even as a nine month person, working however many hours it is, you can do that math. They recognize my wages that I report as my annual income, because that's all I make, as my annual income, and they tell me I'm worth whatever it is, $23 a month or $25 a month. And I just think the fact that we're in a public system where another public system is recognizing our wages as our annual wages should account for some. It is our annual wages. And you've said it a bunch of times. I just want to say it in another way that might help to illuminate what we're trying to say. It, if it's all we're making and it's all we can be making, it is our annual wages. And we live 12 months a year. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Um, okay. So we have one more comment in person, and oh. then we'll move to the folks on Zoom. Go ahead. Um, okay, I had a few questions uh, on the UF team. I am on the GAU committee, but I'm talking not on that behalf. I'm talking as a guy in the system, but now I want that to be on no, the record. Okay, so the first thing you guys uh, brought up was why are we starting at 2017? I think there is a uh, there might have been some experimentation there. Please log in. Please, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like your understanding was that we were bringing it up to say that in 2017 we're not making as much over the years, which has been really important. But, and that's not that big an issue. Our reason for including that graph was to show how the minimum stipend, which is being paid to everybody at the minimum. Has changed over the years. So it was not to talk about those four people, it was to talk about us 4,000 people including this. That's a cycle. My question is this I did some calculation. The minimum in 2017 adjusted for the uh, inflation, meaning the dollar amount, the amount of things per cent in power higher. You guys probably know about it, right? From the law area, right? I need to block the glasses. Okay. Um, Purchasing power, if we can if we convert it, the minimum from 2017 to now, that comes out as a minimum for today around $21,379. That's just adjusting for inflation, the prices of eggs, and the prices of food, the prices of rice. And you know, if I'm being honest, I should say in the prices of uh, quick round, because that's what we're eating. Okay. <laughs> to add on to that, that's just inflation of normal things that we can do. The biggest expense that we have. Is rent average rent back in the day was 600, now it's 1000. You guys like numbers, right? Well, that's an easier and lucky. And <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Right. yeah. Like, that's like, okay. You guys like numbers, they bring right your brains. Um, <laughs> that's a 60 percent jump. So, inflation has been about 25 percent since back in 2016, and rent, which is our biggest expense, is 60 percent more. So 600, it's about 1000, 1100. So, with all that being said. The university was paying us enough money in 2017 to um, uh, at the equivalent amount in today's money at $21,329, but it's not anymore because time has passed and inflation, we haven't kept up with inflation. So we are earning less than we were earning in 2017. I want to ask the group, why are we paying less now? Uh, did something change? Why didn't we keep up with inflation? Why didn't we keep up with rent increases? Uh, what factors led you to decrease our payment? Um, yeah, last year or the year before, I know 
don't know everything in your, you don't have all of it in your memory, right? How decisions are made over the years. So why did you replace our input? That's my first question. I have a few other points. I can stop now. Anybody want to? So I would say to the simplest answer to that is the fact that there's not an, I don't know of any GA contracts that have an inflation or a CPI rider built in. And we, by every year, have to re-bargain compensation on an annual basis. So to some extent, I think to characterize the value of wages over the last six years as something that was being done to you is somewhat disingenuous because every year there was an agreement between GAU and UF that went out for vote and went out for ratification. So it's not as like we did this, it's, it's not as if you weren't represented during that process. Now I understand that there is certainly a perceived difference in who, who, who has the most power at the table. I'm not saying that we all come to the table, I understand that there is a, a perceived significant difference in power differential, like I appreciate that. But so it's what was negotiated and bargained every year since. It's not, it, it wasn't done unilaterally to you is what I would say. Uh, just a response to that. We had our reasons to agree to those um, bargaining um, CBAs that we sure. agreed to every year. And that's internal to us, you know that. Um, I was asking, why did you all not keep up with inflation and, uh, uh, and, and rent rise? Why did that, that not factor into however you plan and however you uh, decide how much you uh, plan to it, it's it's really difficult to do a post-mortem of six consecutive years of bargaining agreements right. and ask one side to go through every subsequent year of motivation. Yeah. I mean, the trend is the same, it's right? difficult. The trend so, yeah, sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. I just so, wanted to, uh, yeah, and this and this past year, as you know, out of the, I mean, the past year, there was an increase to the minimum. It went from 16,000 to 17,000. Nominally, it did, but functionally, it did not. What you would like uh, the final, uh, you know, uh, outcome of this negotiation to be is that there's no increase in the site in the minimum again, right? Which is again an effective decrease in our real wage. So, yeah, I just wanted to convey to the group that that's the real numbers they're talking about. I got you. I know you have your restrictions. Um, Thanks, Abhay. Okay. We actually have three minutes per person because. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I really appreciate your support and I appreciate these. Um, we can come back if there's time. Um, I want to give Burke a chance to talk because that's the next in line on mine, and then we'll have Alicia go next afterwards. Elisha. Elisha, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so I'm 40 years old. I'm an international student, came to the United States with my family with two kids, and um, my net uh, monthly income is uh, $18.50 right now, and I'm paying $12.50 for rent. My apartment complex is offering uh, Fifteen seventy-five in total for this year. So uh, I really wonder. I mean, uh, and I can't work extra twenty hours as an international student. You are not allowing me, my wife to work any any work without volunteering, not get, getting anything as an income. So I really wonder how how you want me to uh, survive in the United States. And you know what? I quit my job in my country. I was a vice president of a, a public body. And you have hired me because of my 15 years of professional experience. You're saying graduate assistants do not have the same experience with the other members of the uh, university. But now you're saying I have to find extra funds. I really wonder what these funds are. And I'm not a US citizen. Let me just put it away again. And I really want to talk to you when I was waiting in the line uh, for the uh, pantry on, on yep. Thursdays early in the morning to yep. load my grocery uh, uh, expenditures. Yeah, yeah if, if none of you have been to the food pantry on Thursday mornings, you should really go. There's about a two, two and a half hour line, mostly of graduate students to get food to supplement because they cannot feed themselves. Because again, what is it? 72% of GAs are food insecure based on what we get paid. So. Thank you, Burke, for sharing. Um, okay, go ahead, Elisha. Hi, yeah, I just had a similar question um, as Burke because the UF bargaining team has been so helpful in coming up with alternative ways that we can survive here. Um, so I think like a lot of students here, I accepted UF's offer with the understanding like, 
yeah, graduate school is hard as shit. <laughs> and <laughs> the stipend is not going to pay for everything. I know that. I took a pay cut from my undergraduate job to be here um, with the understanding that it'll be hard. I can somehow make it work. Um, and, you know, come out on the other side with a better job. Um, I did everything I could to afford to live here and to work here. I had saved up money from my better paying job as a, an undergraduate RA. But when I got here, a car wreck and health issues completely wiped out my savings. Um, and I ended up having to cease medical treatment because I could no longer afford co-pays. Um, I am taking out massive loans, borrowing against my future. I am regularly using the food pantry. And now I'm being forced out of my apartment because rent is increasing way, way faster than my stipend. I've applied for every external funding that I am eligible for. I got an honorable mention from the NSFG RFP, but that doesn't come with any money. Um, so I was just curious, you have bargaining team, what would you do you have any solutions for me? <laughs> what should I do? Doesn't look like we are going to get a reply to that specific oh, question. Sorry. I thought it was open forum. I mean, they directly addressed the U.S. administrative bargaining team, yeah. but there's, there's not there's answer? not enough specifics about her scenario. I, I don't know. We don't, I mean, you can't honestly expect us to. What she's gone through sounds absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. It sounds awful. He, what sorry. he went through. I'm sorry. We can't see who's talking. I'm just letting you know. I, this oh, is yes. just a place for people to share how right. their stipends are affecting them because these are, again, real situations that are happening across the board for GAs. We all have very variable variable backgrounds and variable um, experiences and, yeah. And I think what's most important and the reason we do this is because it's really easy to look at a sheet of paper and say, <clears throat> you're a part-time employee, here's what you are valued at and here's what you should be getting. But again, that doesn't matter when my rent is, trying, is going up 30%. I can't walk up to my apartment complex and say, hey, I'm a half-time employee, here's half my rent. So um, I think understanding and seeing how it's actually affecting the majority of graduate assistants. And again, this is not a minority. We would not have um, comment after comment after comment of this happening. Yes, there are extreme circumstances. What happening, happened to Elisha is absolutely awful. I wasn't diagnosed with chronic illnesses until I came to US. So there are, and there are awful circumstances. But again, the fact that universally, almost across the board, every GA is suffering is something that UF can, and I believe should fix. When so. at the core of this, we are asking for an increase by $5,000 to our contract. We are asking for something that can make it so that we can at least live comfortably in a way that doesn't require us to, at the end of the day, go into poverty, whether that means go in by debt, have another job, have luckily parents who can support us. Most of us do not. The people who show up most of the time do not. Sorry. Uh, go ahead, Jacob, if you'd like to um, unmute yourself. Yes. I wonder, does the UF bargaining team accept the premise that UF could not agree without the 4,400 GAs it employs? I can't. I didn't Sorry, can you say that again? You broke up a little bit. I'm turning up my mic. One second. <laughs> okay. Does the UF bargaining team accept the premise that UF could not operate without the 4,400 GAs it employs? We actually put that, that was on a slide that we actually shared that UF grad assistantships are an important part of UF. We actually put that in our presentation. Okay. So what I've been hearing today is you think that workers should just take loans to survive while working to keep their operation afloat. Why? Yeah, we're talking about graduate students sometimes need to take loans. Well, I'm a graduate assistant. I know, but you're both. You're a student. You don't, get a, you don't get a loan. Loans are only given to students. We are the graduate assistant unit union. Right. So when we're talking with you, we're talking as graduate assistants. Um, so graduate assistants, you're saying, should take loans to survive uh, to keep your operation afloat. So you said you disagreed with the premise that the GAU team started from, 
But you agree with the premise I just mentioned. No, I don't agree fully with your premise. We, we agree that we value graduate students. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna let you put words into my mouth. I, I've seen these sessions before. <laughs> So if you refuse to I'm pay five FTE employees enough to survive, can you explain how it's fair to force the workers to shoulder the operating costs? How it's fair to have the workers shoulder the operating costs? Yes, you said the operation of U.S. De depends on their labors. You mm -hmm. said laborers should take loans to survive. No, you no, said didn't that. say that. Why is it fair to force workers to subsidize UF's operating costs by taking loans to supplement their unfair wages? Yeah, I think you're conflating yeah. multiple statements. That's not what we said. Yeah, not, that's not accurate. Okay. Do you want to start at the beginning? Do you accept that UF could not operate without the GAs it employs? I think maybe our response should be, we listen to every word that people have to say in the comments, and we want to understand the impacts. We may not have a response, but just acknowledge that we're listening to what you have to say. Um, fine. Thank you, Jacob. So, okay, uh, just to reiterate what you said. So our our labor is essential to running this university. Uh, you do not expect that what you pay us should actually cover our expenses. We have to cover our expenses somehow or another. And that's why he's saying that what you are saying is that we have to take out a loan. Yeah, what I'm no, saying. Yeah, you are not saying no, that because it's inconvenient for you. No, it's, it's not, not inconvenient. It's not but it we didn't say that. It's being an entire 2,080 a year capacity person for work with only working 800 hours a year and then saying, because I work 800 hours a year and because I'm a part-time employee, but I have other artificial things preventing me from making other money, you have an obligation to cover me as if I were a full-time employee. That has been the consistent refrain. We've gotten it a bunch of different ways, but that has been the consistent refrain. And the reason that we continue to say we disagree yeah, goes back to what Olivia said. It's not our problem. Yeah, like, uh, well, yeah. you made this decision. You should go figure it out. Uh, we, we're paying you be, uh, uh, what we feel is right for a, a half-time employee or whatever. We have but, two relationships with you. We have two relationships. We probably more than two, but the two main ones are you are an 800 hour for the for the minimum nine month person. You have an 800 hour a year work relationship with UF. You have a full time or part time student relationship with UF. To say that the entire living responsibility and expectation of an individual student slash grad assistant is only within the 800 hour working relationship is just, it's it's a premise that we just don't accept. But for many of us, that is factually the reality where we, international students cannot have any source of income besides their stipend. So how how do you expect them to make a livable, how do you expect them to live? So what if you were what if you didn't, what if you did not earn or win a graduate assistantship? What if you were just a full-time graduate student? You wouldn't have come have here. So we don't, we, well, I think, uh, um, I think there's 12,000 people here that would disagree. Yeah, I think, there are, but I, I can tell you that if I hadn't gotten an assistantship, I wouldn't be here. Okay, but that's you personally. What I'm saying is the overwhelming majority of our grad, of our grad students don't have a graduate assistantship. Okay, let, let's get to the other comments. Yep. Uh, sure. Would you like to speak? You've been raising your hand for uh, a while. Yeah, I want to, apart from the fact that, you know, uh, we, many of us wouldn't be here, and that's an overwhelming number. I personally know, and I know, always talk to me to make the had it not been for like the assist that this stipend for the graduate stipend, they wouldn't have been here. But then they're like, I, I came here late, so I don't know if it's the bottom, but in my department and in other departments that I'm in close contact with, the number of graduate assistants over the past few years have like tremendously gone down, yep. right? And like my cohort in my department this year, like the, 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 the year that I came in, it was just like three people, whereas like the year before, there were nine. Mm -hmm. So, like the department had to reduce the, uh, the the cohorts, and obviously this increases the workload mm -hmm. on each and every one of us. 
Whereas like the silence did not change. And you know, when we were getting accepted into the department of Michael during the opera, during our orientation, they were saying, like, we are actually admitting less students in order to be able to actually provide you with better wages and better stipends. Not only did it not happen, and you know, the workload of but and um, and then you know the expenses are of course going up as everybody knows. So I don't know if these things are factoring in these discussions. Like we went to a meeting with the uh, College of Liberal Arts, and we talked about our workload there. And what was mentioned that whenever you see that you're working overtime, like time yourself when you're working, and whenever you see like you're working overtime, just stop, reduce the work quality, which is something that was implied in what was being said. And so like, on the one hand, when we're being admitted to this university, we are being admitted into a top five college in the country. And then like we're being asked to uh, work lower quality just because we're not getting paid enough, and then, like, of course, the workload is increasing. And I don't know how all these things factor into these discussions. So, this is like just my comments, which is, of course, not a personal situation, it's, I think, a situation that a lot of it's not an accident, it's not a uh, you know, crisis, it's not a uh, personal thing that I'm going through, it's not an emergency or anything, this is an norm. And at least I can speak for humanities. This is what, you know, where I'm at. Thank you. Ashley, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, hi. I just had like, like a really quick thing to say. We keep saying that we work 800 hours, or you keep saying we work 800 hours a year, but in reality, we work may way more than that. And you rely on us to make you look good in the sense that you require our research to be top, not top notch, which requires us to work 60, 70 hours a week in the lab, out of the lab, at home. Not only are you ignoring the fact that we keep this university running based on our innovative research, you are basically saying that you are okay with us being in poverty to do it. You know that as a graduate student, it entails us working more than 800 hours a year. You are choosing to ignore that and the value that we offer. And I don't know if like any of that matters to you, but you're essentially saying that you're okay with us living in poverty and debt to make you look good. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ashley. Anyone else have any questions? Our meeting functionally ends at 3.30, but if public forum doesn't reach till then. I have a question. As a public university, UF, I'm assuming, can request additional funds to pay their graduate workers. Mm -hmm. Has UF done this already? In a whole panoply of ways, yes. yes. Um, when was the most recent? At a public meeting, <laughs> I mean, it was. We actually, there was actually a comment that was made at the last. I believe it was a public comment made at the last board of uh, governors meeting. Actually, do you know how much was requested? I don't think it was a specific amount. I think it was a general request for additional funding. For additional funding, but not specifically to pay graduate workers. I think they were mentioned. I think. I think. He, I think there were several categories of employees mentioned, and grad. I believe. I don't remember because I don't have the video in front of me. But I was watching the watching the meeting, and I believe that they were one of the categories of employees that were identified. And they, it was in the same sentence as inflation being a reason why you know additional funding was requested. Burke, did you have another comment? Do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, I just want to uh, ask a small question. So uh, are you suggesting that since we are paid for 20 hours for our graduate assistantship, are we allowed to say to our ad advisors or chairs that, okay, we are done. We did 20 hours for this week and you're not going to do anymore because we are not getting paid for <laughs> extra hours. <laughs> do we have the right to say this? You actually, it's in the CBA that if they're working more than 20 hours and you do it, you have what would amount to be a slam dunk grievance that we actually have been facilitating with GAU, like I said, since I got here in December. So yes, 
So, so legally, we can say, okay, we're not doing it anymore. Yep. Well, I'm not going to give you specific advice on how to deal with your supervisor. What I'm telling you is normally when I was in the labor world, I normally told the people I represented to work first, then grieve, but you do it the way you want. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bert. Mariana, did you want to unmute yourself? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Um, in that same regard, do you think that UF could operate the way it is operating and advance to a top five university, um, having uh, graduate assistants working strictly 20 hours? I don't, I don't know if enough about the way the metrics work. I know the CBA requires that we can't work in more than 20 hours a week on average. That's clearly enumerated in its own article. Okay, that, that was not my question, and you, you are kind of skirting around the question, um, even like... Well, again, your premise is that your premise is we're violating the contract, so I'm not going to agree with your premise. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's a question that's... It's not. That's, it's it's a, you're asking essentially like a rhetorical question. So. And as Patrick said earlier, if there are instances of that occurring, we want to know about it. Yeah, yeah but like you want to know about it, but like to what extent would it be realistic to say that, yeah, those 20 hours will be um, will be worked strictly for, for every graduate student at UF. I think if you're saying the, the solution is to just come to you and trust that you will um, address it 100%, um, we're then not working with the same foundation of, of like how UF is operating, right? You don't, you don't um, have to trust me. You've got to trust your union because the union in the CBA is afforded multiple tools for when your employer violates the contract. And you don't have to trust us, you have to trust your union in the process with an objective arbitrator. Wouldn't you so, have to uh, make, they, they would be, yeah. they would be step one and step two. The third step, if we get that far, would eventually be a neutral arbiter. But the first two steps are UF affiliated. Right. So after about a month, you could get to a neutral party. And I think Patrick's door is open. And I yes, think we I mean, had Patrick a really good dialogue, yeah. relationship and dialogues talking about these kinds of issues and trying to resolve them. We have an you interest know, in trying to get things. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Like, is yeah, it realistic? Excuse me. I'm sorry. Is it realistic, genuinely, um, to expect this to be the solution for every single grad student at UF? Is it possible, basically? Is it a plausible possibility for every single grad student at UF to strictly work 20 hours and come to you if that does not occur, right? Um, so is there a the system, calls. is there yeah. like- That's what the contract calls. The only thing I wanna add, and I think this is part of what Marianne, sorry, your, your name Marianne. disappeared, um, Marianne, is talking about is the fact that that ignores the very clear power differentials that exist within academic departments that often make GAs very unwilling to speak out, and right? also that it's commonplace, like it's like almost a universal. I mean, and again, you're absolutely right. It's up to them to come out to actually make the change, but to pretend that that abuse is not happening is, is a myth when we've had very well publicized cases of students being overworked and abused by PIs. And again, like it's not a UF problem, it is an academia problem. Yeah, but like even if it's not, even if we 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 step away from the grander, from the general idea, I mean, is there like a set kind of more objective measure of how well you would able you would be able to actually address every single case if every single grad student were to actually work twenty hours? Like, it, it, I don't like is the infrastructure there to be actually to actually do something about that because. Again, um, I don't think if if the if the intent is to again have all grad students work their twenty hours while this is not happening, you know, like how well is it being policed? How well is the system actually working? If there if this is like the outlet for me to you know work the amount that I'm getting paid, right? Uh, Mariana, I'll answer that for you. Like practically speaking, no, they they cannot. They don't have the infrastructure to actually deal with that. Because like, are we I, running clandestine investigations without telling people? No, we're not doing that. Like, but the minute anybody says it's happening, we address it immediately. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not the case. Like, I, I have brought. We've had meetings, Patrick, where I have brought you data from the biology department right. that I collected, 
30 GAs, which is about half of the GAs who right. are teaching at any given time. And the data shows that we work on average 30 hours and at a minimum 26 hours. And uh, so far, except for having a few meetings, nothing has happened from your end. Actually, the only thing that has happened is because some other uh, TA told uh, the person who runs the International Center, who she have to, happens to have a personal uh, relationship with, and she came down on the, the lab coordinator in biology and uh, forced him to make some immediate changes that reduce the workload, but still do not reduce it to below the 20 hours. Okay, uh, that is after I have collected all this data and shown you that there are, like, as, an av so, as a matter of fact, that uh, people, like, that there's an egregious violation of the workload in our contract, and it's been over two months. I mean, or it's about two months since we had that first meeting. And it's so, not like the iron fist of the right, So here's here's what I would say then, yeah. Sikander. Here's yeah. what I would say. And I'm being very honest with you. Yeah. Don't come and talk to me. Just file your grievance. If 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 you want if you want to try to work on solving problems, and by the way, this is not appropriate of bargaining, but if you want to bring it up, let's talk about it. If you want to actually try to resolve problems together. To say that I haven't met with you to talk about this and I haven't had multiple conversations I with said people that in the dean's office, the only thing that has that's happened. what you've seen. Yeah. But we've also been working on resolving it. If you don't want that and you don't trust me, then don't trust me and don't meet with me and don't talk to me. Just file the grievance. Well, here's the thing, uh, Patrick. I mean, I this is why I brought it up because you keep bringing it up that, oh, well, if you just... Uh, if you just bring it up with me and GAU, then like your problems will be solved in terms of your workload. And that's just frankly not the case. Is it going to happen the second you say it? No, the mechanisms work slowly, but there's both an informal and a formal way to address it. And to say that we've just brushed it under the rug or to characterize it that way is not only untrue, but it's also- I, I'm it's, not it's saying you brushed it under the rug, but it's, it's it, I mean, it's been two months now. I mean, like, and and the real, the real, uh, 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 kind of advances that have happened is have not been uh, from your end, unfortunately. Okay, uh, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. Ashley had her hand up, but I think it went down. So yeah, we've got about five minutes left. Um, just like we have time for probably one more. So Jacob, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, you'll be the last person for public comment today. I just want to ask that I'm please bring an offer uh, for our representative bargaining team to see. Um, you said you disagreed with the premise. We've presented alternative premises here. Our labor is essential. If you depend on our labor, then you need to pay enough for us to survive. If somebody was doing a bakery, it's not a reasonable business model to have their workers take out loans to survive while they work at the bakery. Same with any business. If the labor is essential to functioning, you don't have a viable business model unless you pay for them to survive and meet their needs. Can we use that premise of agreement? And can you bring a counter offer next time? <laughs> As I, again, I would disagree with the premise because I don't think you're functioning as a bakery employee. You're more of an apprentice or a student that they may be teaching you pastry or teaching you how to bake bread. And as a result, your employee-employee relationship would not be as simple as somebody who just comes run, run, and runs the cash register. That is so, not true because it is I, true. the labor that I provide, it's written into grants that UF gets a skim off the top of, for the record, but that duty is mine to handle. My research advisor provides research advice, but my duties under the grant that has a amount written into it that me, I do myself on a daily basis. I am a worker and you depend on me to do that work. The grant would fail. It's a multi-million dollar grant and you get a percentage of it as you have. Thank you, Jacob. Any questions? So yeah, I mean, uh, just to uh, say, I mean, reiterate one of the things Jacob just said is like one of the premises that we came here with is that you would give us a counter proposal. You mm -hmm. reject that premise as well? 
We didn't give you a counter proposal. Okay. So are you planning to come with one? We'll give you a counter proposal. Okay. Yeah. That's that's what we're expecting for the next session. And honestly, um, this discussion about our premises and stuff, it's been very counterproductive. I, I feel like we've basically wasted these past two hours. Uh, we're not going to convince each other about our premises. Okay. And that's fine. Okay. Fair enough. We can reach an agreement about Article 10, though. And that will require you to give us a counter proposal and us to give you a counter proposal. And we can meet somewhere in the middle, despite our diverging premises. Okay. It doesn't and, matter how we arrive yeah. to our minimum, you have to bargain with us. And in the end, the, like we both sides have to be satisfied that some of our concerns have been addressed. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it, I mean, so far, none of our, our concerns have been addressed, not even a little bit. Um, and instead, uh, what has happened is uh, basically a set, whole session of uh, distractions, uh, getting bogged down into arguments about our workload, which uh, should not be the purview of, of this discussion, really. And um, also a discussion about uh, what, you know, what you think uh, uh, we deserve or whether you think uh, you should cover our expenses or not. That's really, honestly, uh, you, maybe you think you should cover it, maybe you shouldn't. Um, but we can reach an agreement just by having uh, differences of opinion on on uh, what we're you know what yeah. we think we're worth. Look, I, I I think you make a valid point, Sikander. I think if you guys don't want to talk about any of the details, and it's just just give us as much money as possible. We don't care about the budget. We don't care about any of the other components. Unless you're just going to give us more money, that's the only thing we're talking about. Those are very easy bargaining sessions to run. So look, I'm more than happy to make this much more efficient. If if I will. I will say. I don't think that's. I don't think that's particularly productive bargaining. But if that's what you guys want to do, we can certainly do it more like that. How is sure. coming I mean, to this you, meeting without a counter offer and more effective? Well, I think what Patrick said is he wanted you to understand our philosophy about where the university is coming from on bargaining because it's much different, as you acknowledged. It's much different than your perspective and the core tenets of what he's described here about inflation, cost of living, student status. And ultimately, the comparisons, that is where we are coming from. So that's not a waste of our time to articulate that and communicate that to you. Uh, I mean, I, th I think we all came to this table knowing that our interests are actually like uh, diametrically opposed in many ways uh, relating to these topics. Um, but that's fine. That's why we have the negotiation. Uh, and uh, you need to come, come with a counter proposal and something related to the budget. You keep saying we don't consider the budget. You tell us what part of the budget you're considering when you uh, make it. We've told you out about our budget, right? That, that's what we have to make a daily consideration about. And you, you clearly said you don't care. So I, I mean, I don't see why, uh, why, why uh, we should care. You also haven't even told us what the budgetary considerations are. So do you want to see budgetary considerations yes. or do you just want us to see money? Because I thought we just went through a whole financial analysis that you didn't like any of. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I did come an hour late to this meeting. So, uh, yeah, right. well, they went over um, revenue inspired from tuition. Okay. Um, both graduate and, but again. And we'll share the slides. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, but, but again, also, again, if we're going on comparative, whether you like it or not, our tuition is not worth the same as the tuition at the University of Michigan because the state of Florida has said that it isn't. I think mean? a lot of people have also indicated they want to see yeah. spending, yeah. the U of spending part. Right. Of it doesn't matter. I pay, don't pay it. Sorry, Bryn. So sorry, sorry, I couldn't hear if it was talking about her. No, it was over. I, um, I was also, I also, I was saying that I think a lot of people want to see uh, the spending side of the budget, like what UF is spending their money on, rather than where what they're getting money from. Yeah, I'll, we'll send you the budget document, which is available online, but we'll send it to you. Right, but I think the argument right. here is we make our proposal, we present why we think we should be making this amount. Your team says we cannot afford to pay you that amount of money. The next logical step is you prove to us or show us why you cannot do that because of what X, Y, and Z you are spending your budget on, as opposed to, again, asking more labor from graduate students to go digging for that information. I just thought last week you said it, it didn't, you didn't, like that you were like, you don't want to hear the fact that you don't have No, money. I said it's it wasn't our responsibility. our responsibility to look for your budget. It is not our responsibility to do that. So, so here's one of the things that I think is really important that we understand. In this capacity, you are functioning as bona fide state-recognized bargaining representatives. You may not be paid to do that work, 
But that is a responsibility of you as the recognized mm -hmm. state association and bargaining representative. Mm -hmm. If you don't think it's your responsibility to look at the budget, that's fine. But we wouldn't pay you to do that work. You guys are a recognized labor union. So you do have an obligation or not to know that stuff. We wouldn't pay you as a GA to do it. Information that we I mean, also don't have. We're OK, yeah, that's fine. I mean, yeah. OK, I, I think we're I think we're pretty well done at this yep. point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone for showing up on Zoom. We will open the debrief in probably the next 10 minutes. 10 minutes, yeah. And Rachel, I left the house today and I was driving here and I realized I forgot to get a sticker for you. Oh no, you have more? Yeah. It came in a pack of like 500. Of so. course, which is still not, never enough. 